chicos. I've never seen anyone so in love with his job like Poppy. I would call him the Jacques Cousteau of penguins. When I hear Poppy, first thing comes to mind to me are penguins. Second thing is a huge smile and a big dose of inspiration and hope. Poppy's like a penguin in a human body. <laughs> yes! He's very enthusiastic and he works hard to achieve his goals. Thank you for your contribution. The first memory that I have uh, about a connection with nature was my grandmother. She used to tell me the stories when she visited penguins a hundred years ago in Patagonia. But then I came to this area and I was shocked because in those years, the 80s, 40,000 penguins died per year due to oil spills. I used to pick up oil penguins on the beach to rehabilitate them and then release them back in, into the wild. I decided to pursue an academic career to have more tools to help them better. That's the way I would define myself. Dr. Pablo Garcia Borborglu, or Poppy, has dedicated his life to studying penguins as a scientist as well as a compassionate friend of the species, bringing his knowledge to the world in his own unique way. Poppy founded the Global Penguin Society in 2008 with the mission of creating science-based conservation and education programs to support all penguin species globally. GPS was created because we saw the opportunity to work together with a lot of colleagues, like a network, to promote the conservation of all the penguin species on the planet through three areas, science, protection of habitat, and education. We work really hard to generate a conservation culture. So you, you, you have a holistic approach. We protect the oceans and we also protect human beings, you know, because the oceans are critical for the survival of, of all the planet. Poppy really represents a paradigm shift in how conservation is being done. In terms of an individual working to save a species globally, he can understand deeply the cultural aspects, he can understand the needs of the local people, and then he can communicate those to the politicians and the government in local terms. That human dimension aspect recognizes that saving animals, it really is about working with the people that affect the landscape and the future of those populations. He just conveys the interconnections between us as people and penguins. I think it's key to inspire people. You engage people with the emotions. It should be contagious. I think leadership is about making people feel part of something that is bigger than them. So they feel part of the solutions. It's not like somebody else is doing something about that. That there's, oh, there are some biologists and conservationists doing the work that we cannot. They will save the planet. Let's continue. No, no. Another vital conservation strategy Global Penguin Society has employed is working with the national government to establish marine protected areas in key penguin migration corridors. Many penguin species migrate thousands of miles each year, covering vast parts of the globe. Anywhere they go, environmental change, overfishing, pollution, and coastal development are their biggest threats. Through cutting-edge innovation, Global Penguin Society has uncovered more about penguin breeding, feeding, and migration routes than we have previously known. What he's done is taught the government and scientists here and around the world how to protect these species. He's the person that people listen to. It is estimated that Poppy and the Global Penguin Society has helped protect over 2.5 million penguins worldwide populations increasing in each area they have touched. You have the best nest in the colony, I guess. Passion is the energy that makes everything possible. And it's, for me, it's the only way to accomplish a goal. Penguins are the mission of my life, I know it. I owe penguins everything.
Good morning, everyone. It's really great to see such a warm crowd to hear our speaker this, this morning, this afternoon. It's still a quarter of noon, so I guess I'm okay to say this morning. Those of you that might not know me, I'm Bridget Gurley and a longstanding faculty member here in chemistry and biochemistry and doing additional things serving as Dean of the Faculty and Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. And I was very fortunate when Dr. White's office, President White's office called and said, unfortunately, she is away from campus today doing other important work for us. And so would I be willing to introduce our speaker? And I consider that a really great honor and it's really delightful to be here to get that opportunity to do that. I don't wanna take a lot of his time because I wanna learn all of us to learn from him and I want all of you to have some opportunity to ask some questions near the end um, of him before we have to, to dash off. Um, but I did wanna take a moment to, to share a couple of things. So um, our speaker, did his, studied science, right? So he studied biological science at the National University of Patagonia and started out as a scientist, but also as he found his love for penguins and went on and did his PhD in biology at the National University of Comahue in Argentina, recognized to do the work that he wanted to do and to have the impact on conservation that he wanted to have how important, you heard in this video, his connection to people and his ability to do that, his ability to translate really well between the government and the local community to help people understand the importance of protecting these beautiful penguins and the oceans and recognizing the things that we're doing. And for students, if you think about that is exactly this kind of liberal arts philosophy to thinking about that you're doing with your education here. And I just kind of wanted to connect. You know, we can't do, we can get really excited about the breeding patterns of the penguin, right? But we have to be able to figure out how we translate that breeding pattern of the penguins into something that people understand, therefore, the value and the importance of protecting the habitat. And how do we, from a business and entrepreneurship perspective, get into, Papi and I were talking just before he's speaking about an, a Disney game, an online Disney game, and getting some education into that Disney game about penguins to help people understand that. So it's really with great delight. He's, you know, the Indianapolis Prize, Honestly, when I first heard about it many years ago, I didn't realize how really important it is. It is the considered the world's leading award for um, animal conservation. It's only given once every two years. So I hope we all recognize the, the careful selection. Uh, we're, we're really blessed to have some folks who are connected to us with um, Murdapolium and the Polium Center, who are also big, um, uh, she's on the executive committee for this award, and so uh, really blessed to have that connection, and so we always benefit from learning from the individual who, who won that prize. So I think that's really important for us to, to remember. So without further ado, I introduce to you Dr. Pablo Garcia Borobugu, Bor I am sorry, I do not speak Spanish, and I practiced, okay. and I didn't get it right still. Baragabalu, please join me at the podium. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's, it's very difficult to pronounce. It's Greek. My grandfather was Greek. That's why my surname is Poppy. So everybody goes by Poppy. No <laughs> problems with the pronunciation there. Thank you very much for your very kind words and, and introduction. And it is, a, it is a great pleasure for me and, and an honor to be with all of you today. And uh, thank you so much for your interest on penguins and their conservation. Uh, in my presentation today, I want to show you why penguins can be seen as a group of seabird species that are in problems right now. Uh, what are the, I want to show you what are the features that makes penguins vulnerable to the main threats the oceans are facing now, and what are we doing from the Global Penguin Society to help penguins address those threats. So 
I, first of all, I want to talk to you about why I work on penguins. And part of that was in the, uh, in the video that we've just seen. And you know, my Greek grandfather went to Argentina 100 years ago. He was an immigrant. And my grandmother used to live in Patagonia, the place where I live right now and I work. And she used to visit penguin colonies back then, 100 years ago. They were still harvesting sea lions and elephant seals uh, to make oil. Or they were also producing penguin oil. But the, my grandmother was enjoying wildlife. Ecotourism didn't exist as a concept back then. you know. And then when I was a small boy, she used to tell me these amazing stories about her visits to see the penguins in the wild. She would tell me how penguin adults were feeding the chicks, taking care of the predators. And that was really important because she was the person that connected me to nature. And I am doing this because of her. Uh, that is so important now uh, because it's important that we become the person that connects somebody else to nature. Mm -hmm. So later on, uh, I was shocked because in the place where I live, 40,000 penguins died per year due to the oil spills, per year. So it was very common to go to the beach and find dead penguins or penguins dying due to the oil spills. So I used to collect them, rehabilitate them. There was a huge oil spill, and due to that oil spill, 17,000 penguins died in two months due to that. So after that, after washing a lot of penguins and trying to save a lot of them, like the one you can see in the picture, I, I realized that I had to educate myself because with the good intentions were not enough. So I, I started a, an academic career. I became a biologist, then finished my PhD, um, and then continued my career. But at some point, like you mentioned, I realized that science was necessary but not sufficient to fix conservation problems. So science can help justify conservation actions. And that is why I created the Global Penguin Society. Oh, here. <laughs> And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that later. So I am sure you will agree with me that if there is magic on this planet, a lot of it is in the penguins. Mm -hmm. And they have a fantastic adaptations to live under extreme weather conditions. Like these emperor penguins, they are the only living creature that can survive in the winter in Antarctica, incubating eggs and raising chicks, you know? If with, and in, sometimes in Antarctica, they are incubating the eggs with temperatures of minus 60 degrees Fahrenheit and storms of over 100 uh, miles an hour of wind. Mm -hmm. But if that doesn't surprise you, some penguins, they can dive down to 1,600 feet under the ocean and stay there without breathing for 23 minutes. A well-trained human being, I think we can make four minutes at the most. So that's so amazing. And the thing is that when they are diving so deep, they're fishing in the dark. So they have adaptations to capture the light fuel rays available to be able to find the food. But one of the most surprising things is that penguins have ultraviolet vision. They have this superpower. <laughs> and ultraviolet rays, as you know, are invisible to human beings, meaning that when we are in the ocean, we only see blue. But penguins see a complete universe of colors that allow them to detect their prey easily. But this magic is the result of millions of years of evolution. Uh, we finished a study last year with many colleagues working on penguins, and we studied the DNA of all the penguins that exist right now and all the fossil DNA of all the penguins that are extinct. And we confirmed that penguins are not from Antarctica. They come from New Zealand. There was a microcontinent called Zealandia, now it is New Zealand, and penguins from there started, New Zealand started to export penguins towards South America. Back then, Antarctica was connected to South America. So then with millions of years, new species appear here in South America, went back, but at some point, Antarctica separated from South America, and then penguins conquered the Atlantic Ocean, and then they conquered South Africa, and then the Indian Ocean, and then all the way back up to Australia. That's why penguins only occur in the Southern Hemisphere. I'm sorry, and this is, this is the monster penguin. It's, <laughs> it's uh, the fossil of, uh, the digital recreation of a fossil that was found and it lived in, in that place in Zelandia 60 million years ago. It's, he stood over five feet tall and weighed 170 pounds. Big guy. <laughs> so, but look at the world, look at the penguin world now. 
So there are eight, right now there are 18 different species of penguins on the planet, and unfortunately, half of them are considered threatened, meaning that they are considered vulnerable or in danger in the red list of IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. So since they were in trouble, we decided to create the Global Penguin Society, and we have seen in the video the idea was to work in science. We you know, produce science. We also support uh, important conserv uh, research that supports conservation. We protect habitat in the ocean and on land, and we also have a, a massive education program. One interesting thing about penguins is that they can be seen as fantastic, excellent indicators of the health of the oceans. And this is because they have special characteristics that makes them more vulnerable to the main threats that they are facing right now. For example, most penguins lay only one or two eggs per season. Some species, like the king penguin, they invest 15 months to raise one chick. So if they lose the eggs or if they lose the chick, they lose a big part of their lives. And their goal is to pr produce new individuals for the, for the, for the population. The other feature that is a good feature but can turn into a problem is that penguins breed in colonies. So in one moment of the year, as you can see here, they are all together. And imagine if there is an oil spill hitting the coast. And that has happened many times. So lots of penguins can be affected at once. On top of that, penguins swim hundreds and thousands of kilometers during their feeding trips when they are raising their chicks, but also during their migration. For example, a Magellanic penguin that lives in, in South America, they can swim up to 10,000 miles per year, and they live about 30 to 35 years, meaning that during their lifetime, they swim the equivalent as going around the planet 12 times, you know, swimming, not flying. <laughs> and this is the world from a penguin perspective, you know, different from our normal perspective, with Antarctica in its center. So you have now colonies in Antarctica, also in Australia and, and New Zealand, in South Africa, in Namibia and South Africa itself, and in some countries in South America. And the yellow arrow indicates the place where I live. I live in the southern part of Argentina, in Patagonia, uh, near the penguins, of course. And the next stop is Antarctica, as you can see. And contrary to the common belief that all penguins live on ice and they're all from Antarctica and they love the ice, that's not true. There are only four species out of the 18 that really like the ice or are more related to Antarctic environments, including these funny elderly penguins that you can see now. The other 14, they really don't like the cold as much. <laughs> and there, are, there is a wide variety of habitats that penguins use as this humble, penguin that is hugging a cactus <laughs> in, co in coastal Peru. It is a desertic habitat. And you also have the tropical penguin, the Galapagos penguin that living in lava caves. This is the penguin that lives closer to the northern hemisphere. And I don't know if you knew there are, there are penguins living in the forest. Can you find the penguin in the picture? Do you see that? Don't look up because they don't fly, right? <laughs> so here's our friend, right? It's very, this, is, this is Fjordland area in the west coast of New Zealand, in the south. A very thick forests. This is a Fjordland crested penguin called Tawaki by the Maori communities. It's very difficult to work with them because you cannot find them. I mean, they don't nest in dense colonies. They're, they have spread nests under logs and rocks and caves. So you have to listen to them to, even, to be able to find them. This is the place where they film the Lord of the Rings. Remember the battles? Yeah? So this is like our little hobbit there. <laughs> and the other thing for penguins is that they have a dual life, you know? And this is a problem in terms of conservation because they have to face threats in the ocean, but also on land. It's not like just like a marine animal that they only have marine problems. They have both problems from both worlds. And the main problems they are facing are related to climate change, fisheries, pollution, and human disturbance. Climate change, of course, it is affecting penguins that exist in, that live in Antarctica, particularly because climate change, is, climate change is modifying the pattern of ice formation and melting, you know? And that is critical because it affects the 
availability, but also the quality of the habitat that penguins need to, to breathe, but also to feed, because also the food is linked to the ice. But outside of Antarctica, climate change, uh, what it does, it changes the availability of food close to the colonies when the chicks are small. You know, the parents, they have to go get the food, swim back and feed the chicks. If climate change is moving the food far away, it takes longer for the adults to get the food, more energy and more time. And by the time they come back, sometimes the chicks are dead or they end up feeding the chicks less and that affects their survival of the chicks, you know? And of course, the, the determines the trends of the populations. And one thing, a recent thing related to climate change, it, it is that it is linked to an increase in the frequency and the duration of heat waves that we've never seen in penguin areas. Uh, penguins are covered by feathers, so they, they cannot dissipate the heat, they don't sweat. The only way they dissipate the heat is like panting like a dog, as you can see here, you know? The problem is that sometimes these heat waves reach the lethal temperature. Like in 2019, we had a registered a heat wave of 112 degrees Fahrenheit in one of our penguin colonies. And penguins were dying, healthy young penguins were dying, trying to leave their nests, going to refresh to the coast. So this is a new thing for, for us. The other thing related to heat waves is that it triggers wildfires in penguin areas. And due to the evolution, penguins do not recognize the fire as a threat. So they just don't run away like other animals. They don't escape. And even in the wildfires in Australia and in Patagonia, I mean, we could see images of penguins, you know, um, how you say, um, combing their feathers, you know, uh, printing their feathers behind the flames and until they die because due to the fires. So these are kind of new things related to climate change and penguins. Our main goal in conservation is to improve the management of human activities. So we reduce the pressure, the impact that we have on penguins, making them more resilient to be able to cope with climate change. For example, we create protected areas where we improve the management of oil industries or fisheries. So we increase, for example, in terms of fisheries, we increase the availability of food close to the colonies and reduce the mortality of penguins by when they get entangled in fishing nets during the fishing operations. But on top of those kind of more global threats, there are some things related to, to the nest. Because when you work on penguin conservation, you work at a large scale because they use vast areas in the ocean, but then you have to protect the nest. They spend months in one nest with the chicks and the eggs. And this is a case that we reported two years ago, close to the place where I live in Argentina. Uh, a person with a bulldozer destroyed 22,000 square feet of a penguin colony. And this is an image from a, peng from a drone. So you can see these are the, the nests, the burrows that penguin nests. Some penguins nest under, under bushes as well. But in this picture, you can see the impact of the road. He removed all the soil, destroyed all the burrows, and removed all the vegetation. So there is a legal case now for that, thanks to National Geographic that provided satellite images. It was determined that um, the harm was done when, when penguins were in their nests with the chicks and the eggs. You know? So now um, the justice has to decide. Um, we are hopeful that the benefit will counterbalance the damage and we're also using this case to promote new legislation in many countries, not only in Argentina, not only to benefit penguins, but biodiversity itself. Sometimes it is surprising how exposed and vulnerable wildlife is in some, in some areas. But the good news is that there are many things that we can do to prevent these situations. For example, in one of our projects right now, we are working to create a huge, fantastic protected area in the ocean and on land uh, it is almost, it, it will have almost 600,000 acres, and it is located here. This is close to, this is the southern tip of South America, Argentina, Chile, and Chile, and this is the place where the protected area will be. This area is amazing because there are not only penguins, a wide variety of, you know, animals, it's whales and dolphins and sharks and killer whales, different species of seabirds, terrestrial mammals, and of course, unique reptiles. But again, there are many threats that these animals are facing. Plastic pollution is a global problem, and it's also a, a problem for penguins. We find a lot of plastics in the colonies affecting penguins. 
Part of the plastics come from reckless people that visit this area and they leave the garbage. Some other garbage, plastic garbage, comes from fisheries. You know, 40% of the plastic comes from fisheries. Uh, you can see those images, those big plastic boxes. They are they belong to the fisheries that operate in in the area. The problem with penguins and plastics is that penguins can get entangled in big pieces of plastics, but sometimes they, they swallow plastics that can harm them and even kill them. And another problem in this area is human disturbance. So in this area, in this video, you can see these two fishermen, reckless fishermen, with ATVs. We think they are trying to they're harassing and herding sea lions and elephant seals, so they're forcing them to go into the ocean because there were killer whales there. So he wanted the animals to be attacked by the killer whales. You see the fin there. So the, the killer whales is attacking the animals. The sea lions and, and seals are afraid to come back to on land because these guys are still there. And at some point you will see more fins of the killer whales uh, taking advantage of the situation. So the the thing about this video is you can see the level of disturbance that we need to deal with when we are protecting penguins as well, because these guys also affect penguins. So the original seed to create this huge protected area was a colony that, of penguins that we discovered 15 years ago when it only had six pairs of nests. And uh, this story was recently featured by um, a documentary series of CNN called Patagonia. So here, take a look. The first time the first I time. came, this place was a real mess. There were a lot of reckless people throwing garbage everywhere. We needed to protect this colony. It took several years of clearing trash and getting local support to turn this polluted beach into a protected area. The colony grew from those six original pairs of penguins to over 3,000 pairs now. So that was a home run. So this is how the colony looks right now. Isn't it amazing? <laughs> so the video was filmed in 2020, but in the last census last year, we counted over 8,000 uh, 8, breeders, you know? So this is a home run, <laughs> really. And um, apart from our work to protect habitats, we conduct a lot of research, as I said, to justify our actions. One of the things that we do is, is we track penguins at sea to identify their feeding routes uh, and also the, the food, where are the location of the food sources, and then we see how they overlap with human activities. And then we use this information to create protected areas and also to justify scientifically and design the boundaries of the protected areas uh, that we want to, to, to protect. On top of that, we also follow the penguins during the migration. These penguins, they are six months on land, I mean, uh, with nesting, but six months out in the ocean. And they go all the way from, south, uh, from south Argent southern Argentina up to Brazil, you know? As I've told you, it, when the winter comes, they escape from the cold temperatures. <laughs> they go to the beach in Brazil. But the thing is that during migration, they spend all the time in the ocean and they sleep floating. You don't need to go on land. They spend 80% of their, their lives in the ocean. The thing about this information is that Argentina, unfortunately, is planning a huge oil development, and we want this information to see where are the places where they would overlap and improve the management of those activities there, or at least propose protected areas. We are expanding our action in other countries. For example, our research and conservation program is expanding in New Zealand with these guys. This is the Hobbit we've seen before. And, um, so one of the things, one of the mysteries of these penguins is that it was hard to find them, but it was one of the least studied penguins of all. So before changing the feathers, before molting, they disappeared. And we thought they were coastal because due to the characteristics, they are small. So we put tracking devices on the back of them, and this is what we found. Each line corresponds to a penguin. So the incredible thing is 
that they were leaving New Zealand, going swimming 6,000 kilometers south of Tasmania in Australia, halfway to Antarctica, and then coming back. And we thought they were coastal. <laughs> so this information is critical because then we see we see if these penguins overlap with uh, intense maritime traffic, deep sea mining, or other oil developments. And one other thing that we are doing right now, this is amazing, is now we have critter underwater cameras. So we put the cameras on the back of the penguins so we can see what they see when we are tracking them. And this is one, I selected one of the cases, which was amazing. See, this is a yellow-eyed penguin, uh, one of the endangered species in, in New Zealand. Uh, you can see, you see, the, you see the back of the, of the penguin, right? And you see the bill. So this is what we found. The, he's in the surface. At some point, he will start diving. There he goes. He goes to the bottom of the ocean. But he finds himself surrounded by hundreds of sharks. It was not a good trip. So, <laughs> so he's trying to go back to the surface, trying to find a spot, you know, without and go to the surface be, be, without being eaten. And then he's running out of oxygen. And then he goes back and forth, back and forth. And at some point, he's lucky. And he sees the opportunity, goes quickly to the surface, eliminates air. He makes it. <laughs> and that is good, because it is allowed us to recover the camera. <laughs> and that's the reason why I can show you the video. So this is the amazing thing. These cameras are allowing us to study behaviors we've never seen before, how they capture fish in groups. And we studied marine environments that we've never seen before. Other species that we are helping uh, right now is uh, we are supporting projects to study uh, the feeding behavior of the African penguin, which is in danger, right? The African penguin has a continuous distribution in Namibia and um, and South Africa, now the population is fragmented. And the, the, bad, the sad thing is that the steep decline that this population suffered. This, this picture was taken uh, about 100 years ago when the population was 1.1 million pairs. The same picture was taken in the same place, the same date, and there are no more penguins. And the population collapsed to only 10,000 pairs now. So we are helping colleagues to gather information to stop the plants of the fisheries to eliminate the few protected areas that exist there. But there is no possible conservation if we don't engage and educate the communities. You know? We see that in most communities that live close to the penguins, they don't have information about them. There is no connection to them. And they will decide about the future of these penguins. So through a massive program, we reach local and global children and communities. And uh, in this video, you can see part of the activities that we conduct. Penguins reflect how wonderful and fragile our planet Earth is. They are indicators of the health of the oceans and reveal to us the problems caused by human actions. Global Penguin Society is an international organization that promotes the conservation of all 18 penguin species in the world and the protection of the coasts and oceans they inhabit. To help penguins cope with the main threats they face, we work to generate useful conservation science, promote the protection of their habitats, and carry out multiple environmental education activities. Our education program aims to foster a conservation culture so that people value and understand the importance of protecting penguins and their environments. Through one of our main educational activities, we bring local students and communities to visit penguin colonies in person. Kids are visiting penguin colonies often for the first time in their lives, despite living very close in the same region. We offer them the experience of meeting penguins so that the next generations appreciate and preserve them. We provide lessons, donate books, and provide educational materials to schools so that learning continues in the classroom and at home. <laughs>
In addition to teaching local communities, we also carry out virtual education programs to reach the international community of children and adults. This includes digital educational material on our website, online classes to thousands of students streamed live from remote penguin colonies, as well as presentations and lectures given in person in multiple countries. Penguins live both at the sea and on land, so they uniquely face threats in both environments. Plastic pollution is one of the major threats that affects penguins on different continents, putting their lives at risk. To raise awareness of this growing problem in the communities, we organize beach cleanup events at penguin colonies and nearby areas. We also carry out awareness campaigns to reduce the consumption of single-use plastics at beach resorts. All these actions aim at generating behavioral changes to benefit the environment. The health of the oceans is critical for the survival of penguins and the fate of our planet. Learn more about these charismatic animals so you can join our global efforts to protect them at globalpenguinsociety.org. So penguins have a key role in marine conservation due to their ecological importance. But on top of that, people have a natural emotional connection to penguins. So unmistakably, penguins are the perfect tool to inspire the major changes that we need in individuals, in decision makers, in businessmen, and in the international communities. So far, we have been able to protect 32 million acres of habitat for penguins in the oceans and on land. We have benefited over two and a half million penguins worldwide. We have done a lot, but there's still so much more to be done. And we have new and exciting projects to continue working to benefit penguins, the people that depend on them, and all the planet. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Many things about penguins, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> so I don't, if, questions, yes. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. It's like when they ask you, which is your favorite son? You know, like, <laughs> you, you, I love them all, you know, like, but I, I, you know, for some reason, long time ago, I, I had some sort of connection with the yellow-eyed penguin. You know, there are only 1,200 pairs left on the planet. Uh, they're very shy. You cannot get closer than 20, 200 meters. A very strange animal. I know they're very special. They are considered, all the penguins in New Zealand are considered sacred. They are sacred animals for the Maori communities. When we apply for research permits, we apply for the Department of Conservation in New Zealand and also to the Maoris because you are touching a sacred animal. And there is, they have uh, mytholog mythological stories about the origin of penguins. Penguins were, used to be gods, accor according to them. And during storms, the lightning bolts became their crests. You know? And so we use these kind of things, depending on the country where we live, to connect penguins to people you know, and help in their, in their conservation. Uh, I also love the crested penguins. They are fantastic. You know? They are incredible. And um, the second question was about the lifespan. There is a kind of wide range among, like the ugly penguins, you remember the ones that were walking in Antarctica? So they live between around 20, 24 years. Uh, but Magellanic penguins um, in South America, they live between 30 to 35 years old, which is very unexpected for the, for the size, you know? Uh, they have some uh, genetic protection in their DNA that prevents aging somehow. So soon there will be creams, <laughs> ageless cream, penguin cream, something like that. Uh, so, so yeah, uh, but I think Magellanic penguins are the ones. Of course, the conditions change if they are in a zoo, in captivity, or in the wild. I've heard that the humble penguin in Peru, I think, is still alive, 45 years old. 
But of course, the, it's not the same as being in the wild, you know, and being surrounded by hundreds of sharks <laughs> like that. Yes. Ah, uh, yeah. My wife always tells me, explain <laughs> that you're talking pairs. Because when you work on seabirds and you walk into the, uh, is the microphone on? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you, when you go, imagine you are counting seabirds. You go into the colony, they all fly. So you only count nests. And each nest represents a, a, a pair. So we, we estimate in pairs, you know? Uh, in case of the penguins, they don't fly, so you see them there. <laughs> but in, in seabird ecology, we always use pairs. Uh, and that has been a problem somehow, because of the old estimations. We didn't know exactly if they were pairs, or, but now, yeah, we all always talk in pairs, yeah. The other thing is that it's very hard to estimate the number of um, individuals that do not breed, the subadults, because they don't have a nest. They're there somewhere. You see them around, but you cannot count them, you know? Uh, but like a Magellanic, the penguins in general, they start um, breeding very late. Between the males between four and six years old, and the females between four and six, and males even later, between five and seven. So they spend a long, many years not breeding. You're having fun there, you know? <laughs> they migrate longer because they don't have a nest. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. Yes, the monogamous, it's called serial monogamy. The thing is that the only strategy that can help them be successful when breeding chicks is to have a partner, you know? So, because when they are incubating or taking care of the chicks, one member of the pair has to stay there all the time. So, they take shifts. When he's out in the ocean, she stays, and then they shift all the time for three or four months. They spend a lot of energy do, doing that. I mean, sometimes they, they swim 200 kilometers, get food, come back, feed the chick, and back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Uh, so they use all the fat reserves they store during the winter. You know, By the end of the breeding season, they're really skinny. <laughs> uh, then they abandon the chicks, that they're fat. Uh, chicks go on themselves, and then the adults, they go into the ocean to gain weight again. And the thing, uh, important thing about penguins is that they have this catastrophic mold. You know, flying birds, they mold all the time, but they, they mold the symmetric feathers so they can still fly. Penguins don't need to fly, but they need to be waterproof. So when they are changing the feathers, it takes 10 days more or less, they stay on land, they don't eat, they don't drink water, they just stay like this and change all the feathers at once during, when, during 10 days. Um, and then, it, I, well, I love it because all the colonies are full of feathers flying, you know? That's amazing. Yes. And then you. Yeah, yeah. So the things like, we organize a lot of cleanup events, you know, in penguin areas, we will remove plastics from, peng from the beach, from the colonies, but then it will be a never ending task. We have to stop using it. We have to stop consuming. We, have, we find bottles from countries that are really far away from Antarctica, you know, they've been floating in the ocean forever. So we are also conducting these huge campaigns <clears throat> to eliminate the use of single-use plastics, you know, <clears throat> in beach resorts. And also, we are using this kind of uh, international platforms. We have partners like National Geographic or Disney, like these platforms, to kind of enrich with contents that can help kids or children or people avoid the use of single-use plastics. Um, I am very hopeful that the science and technology will be able to produce new materials that will be more helpful we are still dealing with the problems we already created, and we are still using a lot of plastics. But at least it's a global problem, and people are aware of that. You know? But as, as, as we said before, we were talking before the presentation, we produce science, but, and with scientific facts, you don't reach the soul of the people. So you, don't, you cannot change the behavior of the people only with scientific facts. You know? 
So humans change their behavior if you reach their emotions. So we have to translate the scientific that we produce in a language that reaches the emotion and makes people connected to the problem and they want to be part of the solution. So this is the challenge for, for the next generations, I think. Uh, first, sorry, yes. How old I was when I started? 19, 19 years old. I'm 54 now. Uh, so, but I studied, I, I work, I, st I was studying laws. I wanted to become a lawyer first. I wanted to be an ambassador. <laughs> so in Argentina, you have to be a lawyer first. But after two years, I couldn't cope with it. I, it was not for me, but it was very useful. And then I was shocked by this uh, situation where you could see so many dead penguins on the beach. And the thing is that sometimes when there are problems in our communities, we get used to them. We think they are normal things, you know? And maybe, you know, your parents or People go with situations that you think they are wrong because we get used to that. So I moved to that area and I said, this is not okay. It's not okay to go to the beach and see penguins dying. So that's why I started to wash the penguins and do something with my friends. And then I started to study, to have elements, to have tools, to be able to be more helpful for the penguins. And one thing brought to the other one. And then I had the dream of being able to help penguins globally and to create like a huge colony of people that can help penguins, you know? Yeah, but I was 19 back then, yeah. I still feel like 19. <laughs> yes. Um, you had talked before about how penguins are very popular and so it makes it a lot easier to relate to people and get people on board for conservation efforts. I was wondering if you had any other advice about connecting people with animal species that are less, um, less popular. Fantastic, great. So yeah, you are so right. Not all the animals are charismatic. Or for some cultural reasons, people don't like spiders or snakes. And I mean, they're not guilty for being snakes or spiders. But there's always something fantastic and interesting about them. So like exploring, like working with kids is amazing, you know, because when you share some specific and interesting fact about them and you make them, it's, let's say like you make this game, we have a game called the penguin roll in which maybe the, it was on the video, remember? So they become penguins. After our talks, we talk about the problems, but then they become penguins and they have to run through a room and there are other people with fishing nets or oil or, you know, and they have to go to the room and go to the other place and survive, get the food, come back and feed the chicks. When they become the penguins, they see the threats. The same thing with the spiders. Then if they become the spider and they see how difficult it is to walk through a house and stay alive, or, or you know, all those kind of things, then they get it, you know, and they get it when, when you put on the steps of these, of, of these animals. I have a fantastic colleague that works on bats, and he's amazing because he's linking bats to pollinization and the possibility to produce tequila. <laughs> Everybody loves tequila and mezcal. So let's protect bats, you know, like, oh. So, you know, those connections, like, they, they are ridiculous, but say, oh, tequila is really familiar to me. I love tequila. Oh, I want to support bats conservation. So there's always something. And we have to think, we work a lot with social psychologists. It's not just about biology. We work with facilitators, lawyers, engineers, architects. And, and, and people that work in social areas to understand people's behavior, because the key is to change human behavior. And in terms of the other question about the platforms, it, it depends on the audience. Uh, of course, kids, as we were describing, kids is games. You know, online games are fantastic. So the story we were sharing before is like, like if, it was 20 years ago, I think. Uh, we saw that Disney was running this game called Club Penguin. So you would become, you, you would have a, you know about that, <laughs> okay. You would become a penguin, you will have a penguin avatar. You will go, you have an igloo. But the activity was like eating pizza, uh, you know, dancing, nothing, <laughs> nothing. So we offered them the opportunity to enrich the experience through some content in terms of conservation. 
And then they supported our efforts to create protected areas and support education actions. That was amazing partnership. And there were 100 million kids playing worldwide. So the impact of those things are amazing. Of course, videos are great. But in each campaign, in each country, you have to design the strategy. Because it's not the same if you want to reach people that are over 50, you know, and mostly women, or Facebook, most people are younger generation. It's completely different depending on the country, on the language, and this is a problem for science in our countries. Most penguins live on developing countries, developing, except Australia and New Zealand. As researchers, we are asked to produce papers in English in journals that are not from our areas. Nobody reads English. Governments do not read scientific papers. So our goal is to make that, le that information available in a friendly way so it has an impact on the, on the decision making. You know? But the science, of course, there's always this tension between pure science and advocacy. So sometimes you do advocacy and they look at you as you, you don't, there's less value of that. And you are trying to change the world. But you are also trying to make science more powerful and useful. Because some papers are read by you, the reviewers, and <laughs> your advisors, and a few. Uh, you want, it's your paper. You have to do something. It depends on you. And it's up to you. Yes. Uh, so yeah, my, my major is on seabird. So I did my thesis on, on gulls three species of gulls, uh, but I mean working in, I work specifically on penguins, but through penguins on global ocean conservation. So when we protect, because some of the areas that we, we created, we put the face of the penguin as the attractive things for politicians and for people to support it. But then in one, for example, you, we benefited over 800 species. Some of them we don't even know what they do, but they are there, you know? or maybe they're not so charismatic as penguins, you know? But the good thing about penguins is they use the environment in such a way that they are an umbrella species. When you protect penguins, you protect the environments and a lot of species that coexist with them, yeah. Uh, and I did some research on, there was an interesting thing about nothing. I just, have, just came to my mind. When I was doing my PhD, I was working on the penguins and there, was, there were these killer waves that were coming to this kind of inlet to eat sharks. So we took that opportunity to make observations and publish something about these killer waves. They were specialized on eating sharks. That was, that was interesting. <laughs> yes. OK. So I, at the beginning, one of the things for me is that I work for the National Research Council in Argentina, so they want me to publish. They don't care about conservation. It's just <laughs> publishing, you know? And if I do, so it was like having a, another life, a life as a scientist and a life as a conservationist. But I, at some point, I could kind of merge both things. You know, It was harder a long time ago. Now it's kind of easier. And I, I found a way to merge bo both things. So at the beginning, the difficult thing is to, to, to engage people into your idea. Because when you have an idea, it's like, oh, he's crazy. He's not going to do it. I mean, he's, and everybody's against you at, at the beginning. You know, everything is difficult. But I, I think with, if you have a dream, you have to prepare. Good intentions are not enough. But you have to prepare yourself, work hard, and have good intentions. And then the, th the, the thing, things will come. You know, there's a phrase of this philosopher, Seneca, the thinker. I don't know in English, but it would be something like, there is no wind that blows in the right direction if you don't know where to go. You know? <laughs> if you're sailing and you have no destination, the winds blow and you cannot take advantage of any of them. So try to find what you want to accomplish in your life. You know, what's your goal? The crazy one. The one that makes you really afraid of. And then focus on that, focus on that. And we had a lot of problems. This is the successful story. <laughs> Imagine, <laughs> I live in Argentina, Jesus Christ. 
He said, <laughs> I'm a survivor. So like, it's full of many, many problems. But I, for me, it worked to be kind of inspired by the penguins. I mean, they are so small. They have to go get the food, hundreds of kilometers, go through the fisheries, the oil, human disturbance, the predator, the humans. And then they go, they're focused, they do, and they come, and they raise their chicks, and they release the chicks. So sometimes we get inspired by them. They're so driven, and determined, and brave. Um, so when, at least for me, it works when I'm in the middle of the storm, and I want to quit, I look at the end. OK, what's, what's the goal of all of it? And then it helps. Yeah. Just do it, <laughs> would be the, 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 the advice. Yes. Yes, yeah, in two different ways. One thing about the fisheries and one, another thing about the plastics that they discard. So in terms of the, of the fishing operations, we work in, at least in Argentina, we work also with other organizations that work in marine conservation. We work together as a front. And we, we push to pass laws and also to improve the management of protected areas. Uh, protected areas is not a place where you lock it and throw the key. It's a place where you order the use. So you decide, okay, this is a place where you can fish in this way in this moment of the year. It's like your house, you know. Uh, all the house, you need to keep the structure so the function of the house continues. So the same thing happens with the environment. You have to protect the structure so it continues offering the, the function, you know. So uh, that in terms of, of, of fisheries operations, uh, controlling the gear, controlling... There are many, many different situations because you have penguins are facing different kinds of uh, fisheries, like krill in Antarctica, anchovies, all these uh, forage fish like sardines, etc. Um, and then in terms of plastics, we are offering courses for the fisheries industries. Uh, and also we are helping to design structures on board so those big plastics of boxes don't fail. You know? uh, but, and it's, it's working, it's working because it's not like they want to do that. You know? <laughs> Sometimes they don't want to do that, but that's the way. That's a problem when you, when you get used to the status quo, like we were doing. When you get used to the things because they're, they've, been doing, they've been going on like that forever. No, if they're wrong, they're wrong. So yeah, so we're working in the, with the fishers in, in that sense. Uh, we also help sometimes with the certification of some fisheries. You know, some fisheries are certified, like Marine Stewardship Council, so we offer some expertise of, or, or feedback in, in that sense. Yes. Um, I really appreciate um, what everything. <laughs> Yes, I, thank you for the question. I think the world has changed in a good way, you know? We are questioning ourselves in many things, you know? Uh, also in terms of science. And, and I think that the new generations, uh, they have some things in the DNA that are so positive, you know? I'm hopeful for the future because of young generations and technology. Uh, but also in science, I also see young, mm, young students and, and scientists that they, they see the world in a different way. They want to make their science useful, you know? Not only just publish or... Of course, not... I mean, I'm talking about science that is linked to conservation. There are areas in science that... I mean, you don't do this. You don't, I mean, you don't talk to people. You don't, some areas are just to produce pure science, you know? But in my area, um, I didn't feel it was enough to publish, you know? And just say in the discussion, this information will be useful for conservation, whatever. No, it was not enough for me. 
I mean, for somebody else, and it's fine. I mean, but for me, no. And it was, it was difficult at some point to face the criticism from those researchers that were more into the science kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, this is because you get into the mud, you know? <laughs> you risk your reputation. But I think this is important, at least for me and for the team that uh, work uh, with me, you know? Because in the end, the most important thing is what we leave, the legacy that we leave, you know? And creating a marine protected area is, let me tell you, amazing because it makes me think, this is gonna stay when I die. <laughs> this is gonna stay forever. This is gonna be something that will have an impact in the long run, in the long term. Now we'll, nobody will eliminate forever, you know? So, so yeah, you know, and, but I think there are many more opportunities now than even 10 years ago. Things are changing. Many things are changing in the bad way, but many things are changing in the good way. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you. Okay, here. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, sometimes, <coughs> how can I make it short, Argentina. So Argentina and many countries, we are very used to, very, uh, to a very high instability in terms of conservation, in political instability, and social instability. If we have a turnover of 10 months per minister. So you're talking to <laughs> some protected areas, you need two years to do, go through all the participatory projects with the communities, to make agreements. So then you're talking to a person that will no longer be <laughs> in his position. And then you, you keep on changing and changing and changing. So in that sense, what we try to do is um, look at who are the stable stakeholders. I mean, politicians come and go, you know, but the technical staff in the governments, they don't and they have the institutional memory that is important to help implement those protected areas or the laws or whatever in, in the long run. You know? And of course, the members of the community, they won't move away. And they are, if you involve them and engage them, they are supportive. Uh, and politicians, they want votes. So if you have a community that really wants something to happen, they will pay attention to the, to the community. When we specifically work on legislation, which is your, your question, Sometimes we reach the advisors of the congressmen or presidents or, or, or whatever. But let me tell you, I mean, when I won the prize and it was announced in London, the presidents called me. I said, what? I said, because I didn't think presidents con were concerned about conservation. And these kind of awards and the recognition of this, they put you in a place where politicians pay attention, you know? Uh, presidents calling, Jesus. I mean, <laughs> and then he said, ah, so this is important. It's becoming important. That's the mo one of the most important things about awards. They increase the visibility of the things that you think are important. And also, they open a lot of political doors. Because I think in the same way when I was 19 years old, you know, I didn't change. But now they pay more attention. Maybe because I'm older. <laughs> but also because of these recognitions. I, I, and that happens a lot in our countries. When you're recognized abroad, then they pay attention, you know? And, and that, the same thing happens with legislation, you know? We work a lot with advisors. We have our own lawyers, yeah. That sometimes, this is interesting, sometimes it's not that governments are mean people that don't want to protect wildlife. They just, they have other priorities. The environment is, it's not a priority. They have economy, social problems, uh, you know, many issues, health. Uh, sometimes they don't have the, capacity to do that. So when we partner with some governments, we say, okay, this is important. With the science, we show how to solve the problems. We fund the projects, we fund the processes, whatever. And sometimes we even provide, um, we have our lawyers that work with their lawyers to draft the law. They said, this is the law. You don't even have to take time to do that. You see if that is possible. And then it goes into the Congress and get passed. Because sometimes everything is done and it takes two years for them to write the law, to draft. And it's not that they are against it, it's just that they, they have other things, you know? Everything is always on fire in Argentina. <laughs> so, yeah. I was just curious about the 3D model reconstruction of the uh, plasma framework. Does your team take that uh, model? 
the what the, the model for the yeah, like the, the, the underwater camera you mean no no the model of the existing like the cyber one ah the digital no i didn't do that oh. that was made by the uh, the um, there was a lab in ge genetics in new zealand okay. yes the ones that discovered the the monster penguin ah. yeah okay. yeah they did everything that was amazing that was amazing yeah, yeah. there's a very specific bone that only penguins have is the it's, and when you find the fossil of that you know that it was it belonged to a penguin and this guy normally the bone is like this small this guy was a, a thing like that and it's the bone that is here that supports all the weight so it's a huge thing so if you find that bone it's a fossil penguin Yeah, yeah, you're right. People love them. <laughs> people love penguins. I don't know if people love them because they identify with them, because they commute to find food, maybe because they look well dressed. I don't know what's the thing. <laughs> um, but yeah, they are great ambassadors. One of the critical things is that uh, when you have animals in captivity being ambassadors, you have to make sure that the conservation efforts go to protect the ones in the wild as well. So the message has to be very clear that we need to protect the environment where they live. Because we're facing a lot of risks of extinction. And it's like when you have a king in a, in a kingdom. A king exists only because he has a kingdom. You cannot rescue the king by taking him out. Because without a kingdom, he's not a king. The same thing with the animals. You need to protect the habitat. Um, the habitat is everything for these animals. We have problems with some penguins when they use the habitat in such a vast way, because you cannot protect all the southern hemisphere. You know? So you have to make very difficult decisions sometimes. OK, what's the limit of that protected areas? OK, we protect up to this, because you have to negotiate politicians, businessmen, uh, the private sectors, fisheries, some mafia sometimes. <laughs> so you have to deal with all, all, all these situations. But yeah, I think there are many more opportunities to use a charismatic animals to connect people m more to, to nature. And penguins are a fantastic case. Yes? I'm just curious if you might speak a little bit about the different ways that different aspects of your work is funded. So for example, I'm going to assume that science is funded a little bit by the National Science Council, sort of the equivalent of our NSF. Um, but your conservation Amazing. I love to talk about that. There are, there are different models. Uh, in general, what happens with the science in our countries is that due to the lack of instability, of lack of stability, uh, sometimes you, leave, you need to censors, for example, to give you some data. In the long term, you cannot miss. And if you have a crisis like we have, you, you cannot miss that information because your data will be destroyed, your database. So we have international funding that secures <laughs> the continuation of our database, because otherwise we, we cannot make any projection or anything, you know? So we, in that sense, we have international funding. So uh, s with grants, you have money for specific objects, but it, it is one year or two. So you cannot think that bigger. You cannot think that big, you know? It's just for very restricted money and secure things. That's for more science thing, you know? In terms of conservation, you have a lot of uncertainty. You take a lot of risks. You depend on politicians. You depend on legislators. You depend on communities. If there is a crisis, everything <laughs> fails, you know? So you, there are a lot of risks. So we started to develop an individual donor portfolio here in the United States. So we are registered here in the United States, and we fundraise a lot here, and also in England, uh, and in Europe some, sometimes. Money doesn't come from Argentina. We don't have this philanthropic culture in our country. Um, but that money is fantastic because in some cases it's unrestricted. So you can make quick decisions. You don't have to apply and see, oh, I have to change this objecti objective, blah, blah, blah. So it allows you to, to adapt quickly to the, to the situations. Yeah. And sometimes the grants are amazing. 
these kinds of, uh, sorry, the, the awards and prizes are also amazing and helping a lot because it, they also help, they legitimize the work that you do. So they open the gate to new donors, you know, and, and meet new, new people. So you have a, a wide variety of things. The, the critical thing for us is to secure a minimum to secure our operation, you know. And then the key thing is to take a lot of risks. And it depends on who you are funding with. You know, some people, they want feasible things that are concrete and are visible. Uh, and sometimes you don't know if you can do it. You just have to take the risk. And then you say to the donor, okay, I don't know. This is important. We can try, but I don't know if we're going to be successful. So as long as we are, do we are honest, because we like them not to be donors. We like them to be partners. They are helping penguins together with us. They're not giving us checks, you know? And that's, that's the key. That's the key for them, to make them, uh, make them feel they are part of the colony. <laughs> Yes. Last question. How do, you, how do you stay so hopeful? <laughs> how do I stay so hopeful? Um, I think, I mean, just as I said, the two things that are important for me is to see the new generations. You know? I have two sons, 26 and 22. One is, is uh, business, um, he studied business economics, see? and he's a, he's a master of, in finances. And the other one, he's studying mechanical engineering but nothing to do with biology. But they, they, have, they, they consider the environment in every decision. They don't need to be biologists to work in conservation. We all have a role. So, and I see that in all the young generations. They really consider the environment. The other thing is technology. I mean, science and technology, they are you know, creating things that are solving the problems that we created and avoiding future, future problems. And, and in general, like I said, like living in Argentina is not easy, but somehow you develop the skin to go through things, you know? Uh, and said, just focus. Okay, what do you want to accomplish? Okay, go for it. Through the storm, you know, like, and, and yeah. And it works, and sometimes, you know, out of the blue, things come. I always like, we were talking about that movie, uh, Erin, Cast Away, Cast Away. Remember the, the movie? It's an old one, sorry for the young ones. <laughs> with Tom Hanks, cast away, that he's a FedEx guy that strands on the beach. Everything goes wrong for him. He, he wants to commit suicide and it doesn't even work. Remember that? And then when everything fails, and we had that, those situations sometimes, I said, we have to wait and see what the tide brings in. And sometimes, out of the blue, you know, things, solutions come. So when everything fails, just wait. I learned to be persistent but patient also. You know, uh, that's the only thing I see that uh, can affect the younger generations. They don't have, they're not so patient. <laughs> but, uh, but that's why I'm hopeful, yeah. And many things worked. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Fantastic question. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks.